still vividly remember being a newcomer at my home congregation. I remember the way the stained glass cast a golden light across the floor and the plants climbing up the walls, and I remember how much the people were a part of the church. There was this time at the beginning where anyone could go up and talk about something meaningful in their lives. This was supposed to be a time for telling about births and deaths and new jobs and stuff, but sometimes it was like your kid telling you they just discovered that their cat likes pancakes or someone's poem about the ongoing saga of their furnace repair. One time it was Eleanor telling us that we needed to vote this week and she won't tell us who to vote with. She knows that's not allowed, but certain people are more in sync with our principles than others. And if we don't know what she means, we should come talk to her at coffee hour. <laughs> After the sermon, there was always this response time where the service leader would say, we know that among us, the truth is not spoken until any voices were heard, are heard, and then the people would get up and they would share what's in their hearts, which was supposed to be related to the service, but was sometimes more details about the ongoing furnace repair. And this was where you really got to know people from what they shared. And I couldn't muster up the courage to speak myself, but I carefully took notes on who all these people were and what I might talk to them about later in my quest to turn them into my friends and find my place in this new community. On Sunday, one of the talks, one week, was, the, was about feminism and female empowerment. It's hard to empower women, said one congregant, frustration making his voice short, when they won't show up. I try to get women onto the boards I serve on and they turn me down. And two rows away from me, a woman made a little gasp and put up her hand for the microphone. Sometimes, the woman said, when it was her turn, it's hard to show up in exactly the way you are supposed to. Sometimes, as women, it's all we can do to keep the house running and the kids okay and to take care of the extra things that we're somehow expected to be responsible for just we're women. And her words started to sound funny, like they were holding on to the inside of her for dear life and refusing to come out. And at the same time, they seemed to be tumbling one over the other all over the room. And she talked about life as a single mom on welfare and the struggle to fit into systems not designed with people like her in mind. Tears poured unselfconsciously down her cheeks as she talked. I was so enraptured with the story she was painting that I didn't even realize that the room was tightening slightly. Faces began to look the way that muscle between your shoulder blades feels after a long day of work, like they were holding something heavy. After church, I invited her over for lunch, not because of what she said exactly, mostly because somewhere nestled in her torrent of emotion was the tiny kernel of the fact that her kids were nine and 11, which was about the same age as my kids, and epic friendships are built out of having kids the same age. Months later, she told me she couldn't believe I would offer that right after her entirely inappropriate meltdown in the middle of the service. I was confused. I didn't know you weren't supposed to melt down in the service. I thought that was what spiritual homes were for. The broken stuff, the hard stuff. Not a place to dump it for others to carry, but a place to share from the heart. They had said, we know among us the truth is not spoken until many voices are heard. That means many voices. Gasping and singing and sobbing and giggling all the voices, even the untidy ones. I have always fought for the place of hysteria in our faith. In case you haven't guessed yet, the meltdown woman was me. And that lunch was the start of a beautiful friendship, one that has supported, challenged, sustained, and definitely inspired both of us over the past two decades. But let's go back to the meltdown. What I remember about that day was the uncomfortable feeling that my gender was being characterized as not showing up or not pulling its weight when it seemed that all I did was show up and pull weight. I was raising kids, preparing to go back to school, cutting hair in my kitchen to make ends meet, and not long after that event would become the church treasurer. What I didn't have was money. Money for childcare, money to get better deals by buying in bulk, money to purchase or operate a car. So everything I did was funded by the currency of time. And a wealthy man was telling me, telling the congregation that women weren't showing up to accept his invitations. My mother's life mission had been peace at any cost. After a challenging childhood with her single mom, 
a hard-working woman who regularly moved or boarded out my mother so that my grandma could go to work. The only thing my mom wanted in life was peace and stability. Peace at any cost means you swallow your feelings and concerns, you hold it in so you don't upset the apple cart. So I grew up in a middle-class, comfortable home with the traditional gender role divisions of labor, never worrying that I would be separated from my parents or wondering where my next meal would come from. But there was a different problem. My dad, introverted and caring, but also quick to anger, was the center of her universe. Peace at any cost. So I was trained to anticipate how he might respond and to act accordingly. It didn't matter what I was feeling in the shadow of what he might feel. I spent my childhood wanting to grow up to be the dad rather than the mom because being the mom seemed so small and squished and being the dad seemed so free. As an adult, I can see now that neither one of them was free to be themselves in that scenario. We hear the old saw that men are rational and women are emotional. And this distinction is pure poison. We are all both, both and more. And these things are indivisible. Women have been characterized as hysterical as a tool to diminish them, to contain them, to discredit their contributions and to prevent them from holding power. Imagine my shock when I stood up in church that day and spoke the truth of my situation, stood up for women, stood up for low income people and let all my messy feelings show in such a public proper place. The truth of me and Liz too, is that we are anything but containable or proper. Of course, we can get cleaned up and behave in a formal setting, sort of, but our core personality styles are a combination of exuberant and messy. One of my big lessons while studying for ministry was that I could never drink at church events, not a single glass. Not because I didn't know my limits or couldn't hold my alcohol. I grew up with five brothers and had plenty of experience proving that I could hold my own in a social setting. Rather, it was because I'm a social being and I'm loud by nature. Big E extrovert, passionate, enthusiastic, and strong-willed. And if you are all of these things, exuberant and messy, you might gesticulate wildly while talking and occasionally knock over a wine glass or stumble when you are overcome with laughter while trying to fill a plate and tell a story at the same time. Basically, people think you are drunk. Now, when you're the minister, even in a purely social setting, you are always working. And drunk doesn't exactly come across as professional. So while I have learned to lean into my honest self, to risk letting the world see who I really am, to trust that people's understanding is expansive enough to welcome a large personality as being something more than just an hysterical woman, is it, it is still too precarious to risk enthusiasm being conflated with intoxicated. I empathize with the drinking thing. <laughs> this is a real problem for me as well, which is surprising because I never drink. And yet, I will frequently go to a party and I'll go to leave and someone will gently put a hand on my arm and so kindly ask me if I'm sure that I am good to drive. This can be awkward. I have to respond that no, I am in fact stone cold sober and what they are witnessing this thing, this is in fact my natural personality. <laughs> I was not raised to be quiet. I was in fact specifically raised to take up space. I remember one year, my sister came home from school crying because her desk didn't fit. I mean, it fit technically, but she wanted to swing her leg and there wasn't enough room for that. And my parents heard her out and then they spent the evening talking to her about civil disobedience and Henry David Thoreau. Talking about Thoreau was my dad's parenting response to most situations. My sister arrived at school the next morning and politely removed everything from her desk and stacked it on the floor and began working. When asked, she explained that she was on desk strike. Until she was given more appropriate seating, her teacher met this with scorn and then with frustration and then with a trip to the principal's office and eventually he met it with a new desk. And I think of this a lot when I'm in situations where there isn't quite enough room for me, that it is okay to claim space even when it isn't convenient. 
It's okay to leave too if you need to, but often the most powerful statement is to stay, to stay in the room and also to push back. And when I'm in those situations, I often think of my sister, books spread out on the floor, working alongside her desk. That poor teacher. <laughs> Sending your kids marching off to school declaring, let my life be a counter friction to stop the machine is a little unfair to the administration, don't you think? It, it's not a hit with the teacher. Frankly, it wasn't even a hit with the other students. On Walden Pond, not what the children were reading when I was young. I know from personal experience that Thoreau doesn't go over well in elementary school, didn't go over well in seminary either. Even you use seminary, which surprised me. Since our tradition is entwined with people like Thoreau so heavily that we sometimes claim he was one of us, you'd think I'd have felt home, at home there, but I didn't. Words like pedagogy and eschatology make me feel itchy, and every time someone refers to hermeneutics, I would think, does anybody else hear Herman knew dicks? <laughs> no, <laughs> nobody else heard that. They were too mature to hear that. They were there to learn. For me, it was UU Seminary, not my family, that was the place where I learned I was supposed to be tidy and go with the system. I, I tried to learn that anyways. My mind was like a squirmy and obstinate toddler, always wiggling away from my homework to go hunt fun things. I was forever abandoning the boring but accurate words of the UU Historical Society that I was supposed to be reading. Instead, I would do things like gather the other seminarians together to found the UU Hysterical Society, which we used to play very elaborate and extremely historically specific jokes on each other. At first, then we discovered memes. Memes, those are the place for the Herman New Dicks kind of style of thinking. One day, I stopped asking myself why I was such a wrong-sized seminarian, and I started asking myself what kind of right-sized thing I was. One day I stopped deciding that I could, one day I decided that I could follow what I loved from both worlds, creating a space for the UU laughter that I craved and that I would stop trying to fit into the desk and start working alongside it. I decided to stop thinking for the care of the care and love of my growing UU hysterical society as goofing off, as the thing I did when I was taking a break from the ministerial formation process that was breaking me. I started thinking of it as my own style of ministry. And I stopped thinking of myself as breaking. The cracks are how the light gets in and also how the light gets out. Humor matters because religion isn't just about what you believe. It's not just about the theology or the ideas or the structure or the bylaws. It's definitely not about the bylaws. It's about shared culture. That's when we that's why we sing together. That's why we tell each other stories. It's why laughing together is so important. A good joke is a way to share culture. It's a different kind of welcome. And an idea that is intertwined with humor is a message that's easier to pay attention to. It's easier to share with others. It can go places that lectures and academics texts can't go. And it makes space for more types of people, including people like me. A good joke connects us. It allows us to think about things from a new angle. It allows us to approach tricky topics in a new way. A joke is a risk. We try and sometimes we miss the mark or we're even hurtful. And working through that is a way to learn and a way to care for each other. A joke is a way to release tension too, to connect with each other and just to have a shared breath. It opens us up in a new way. I think that's why they call it cracking up. And I don't think it leads to breaking. I think it leads to hatching. If you have ever felt or been told that you were too much or not enough, let us dispel that for you right now. The world is beautiful and messy and complicated and you are absolutely the right sized thing for your own beautiful, messy, complicated life. We do the silliest things to try to hide our vulnerabilities. When I was a teenager, I would wear jeans to the beach while my friends were all wearing swimsuits and frolicking in the ocean. It took me years to realize that people could already tell that I was fat.
and that I was roasting on the sand because I believed the story that being fat was shameful, that I didn't have a body that fit the beach. And even as recently as a few years ago, when my knees were disintegrating from arthritis, I was too stubborn to use a cane because using a cane made me feel that same kind of vulnerable again. It made my pain more visible. And again, there was no one who saw me walk and didn't already know that I was suffering. When I accepted my reality and made peace with the necessity, I discovered that using a cane cut my pain in half in half. Now I just want to carry spare canes and hand them out whenever I see someone struggling. But we know that hatching doesn't work that way. Hatching happens when the conditions are right. And that's one of the gifts of religious community, creating conditions for growth and healing and transformation, creating a supportive nest for hatching. When we try to squeeze ourselves into places or programs or cultures where we don't fit, we end up crushed. We get smaller and smaller, trying to fit in, trying to be invisible, trying not to stand out, or we end up leaving because there was insufficient room for us to bring all that we are. This is the bring all that you are wind up part of the sermon. Our Unitarian Universalist communities, whether it is our congregations with our Sunday services and all the other activities, or the UU Hysterical Society with its online mirth and dignity, our communities can be places where people thrive when they recognize that all of them is welcome, cracks and all. People have teased me that I'm not happy until somebody is crying. And it's partially true, I mean, I don't need you all to be crying all the time, but I do need to know that the spaces we create together are safe for crying and laughing and cracking and singing, whether you can carry the tune or not. When a place is large enough and gracious enough to hold someone's pain, unexpected ugly cry and all, it reassures others that their pain is also welcome. When a community is brave enough to take on challenging conversations, to risk and learn and change together, then people with marginalized identities or with diverse learning styles might find that there is also safety for them. When a gathering is generous enough to celebrate our joys and laughter, even when we laugh a little too loud or at the wrong spot in the sermon, well, you know. When we make room for the variety of ways of being, when we remember that all people are our people, in all of our beautiful, messy, complicated glory, then we are living into the covenant that makes us Unitarian Universalists. This is the work we are called to do together. May it always be so. Blessed be and amen.